Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased and honored to present Gary, uh, today's presenter, uh, to talk about intelligent building operation. Gary is an uh, electrical engineer, engineering chartered electrical engineer by background, but has a, a professional doctorate and master degree in intelligent building, both from uh, uh, Reading University. Gary has been specializing in design construction on the uh, managing optimizing intelligence building across UK and uh, in London, and he's managing a, um, a company as a, a CEO. Now we hand over to Gary. Thank you, um, Yang. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, no matter where you are around the, around the globe. Um, I've been asked to talk today about the realities of um, real estate uh, management. I tried to condense quite a lot of things that are going on in our specific world within Brookfield properties at the moment uh, to try and bring some um, some reality into some of the key decisions that we're having to make over the next um, the next uh, ten if not um, three decades um, of time uh, to come. So perhaps first I'd better just tell you who Brookfield Properties are. Um, we are quite a conservative, very um, quiet organisation, but we do we do actually put ourselves around, around the globe. Um, we're a very large organisation. We are a real estate investment firm, um, and by that we mean that we invest in all sorts of um, um, investments, whether they be uh, renewables, whether they be real estate, whether they be um, um, transport, we operate around the globe. Um, we have under investment something like $690 billion of portfolio investment that we're responsible for. Um, we're around about 180,000 um, employees. Um, we have and operate within about 30, 30 countries around the globe. And you can see our, our, our coverage um, on that particular map. Um, you can see in those those maps the, the, the amount of um, assets under management, AUM, in those specific regions. So we are a major, major player, if not the largest player in real estate investment management. In terms of the global presence, um, in terms of offices, retail, multifamily, logistics and hospitality, we are perhaps one of the major players. You can see in, in, in offices, um, we are around about 100, uh, 199 million square feet of assets under, under management. I'm sure that will tip the 200, 200 uh, quite soon, um, but we are again sizable. We have vast experience of each one of those specific um, areas of, of investment. So the immediate challenge for Brookfield properties, amongst many others that um, I'll come on to later on, um, is ESG, the new acronym that we're all trying to deal with um, in various different ways uh, from Brookfield properties um, through to Trump, through to British land, through to um, lend lease, so all of the particular property developers and property management companies around the globe are now dealing with the, the challenge of ESG, environmental social governance principles. When we start to understand the property impacts on the environment, um, we're specifically at the moment dealing with a, a specific problem in terms of how do we, how do we understand and categorise the various um, uh, emissions that buildings and the built environment is 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 putting into into the atmosphere the current the current approach is to to look at defining those into scope 1 2 and 3 specific types of emissions and those scopes 1 and scope 2s are those which are probably more directly attributable to the built environment i.e. the the energy that is produced and, and consumed in those specific buildings but also we have the scope three emissions, which we'll come on to uh, further in the next couple of slides, um, which is which is the big one. Um, and the, the one specific part of the emissions map and the emissions roadway uh, that most of us are, are currently struggling with, 
we can deal quite easily with scope one and two. That's about energy. And by manage, measuring energy and managing energy, we can minimise those scope one and scope two emissions um, relatively simply. But when we move to scope three, as we'll see shortly, these are not associated with the built environment per se. This is about the supply chain that supports um, the whole business uh, that that organisations or companies are within. And there's a real issue here that double accounting of emissions could occur, particularly in the scope three uh, element. And we're seeing already that when we look at landlords and tenant relationships, that we're seeing that we have to categorise the use of energy by the tenant and by the landlord in two distinct ways. In one way, it could be scope one for the tenant and scope two for the landlord. And then conversely, it could be the, the other way around, depending on how that relationship exists. So there's some real complexity into what should be a relatively simple means of monitoring, measuring and targeting our emissions profiles. Brookfield's ESG mission, I'm just showing this to contextualise some of the issues that we that we currently face in terms of how we look at um, environmental social um, governance. <clears throat> you can see here this is uh, four particular pillars, strategic pillars that we're looking to adopt and promote. But the first green one is, is where we lead on sustainable solutions. So whether that's waste management, greenhouse gas emissions, climate risks, uh, energy, water, biodiversity and sustainable development. Um, but there's also an issue around where we put things like cyber security. Is cyber security in the right um, in the right pillar? Should that not be in lead on sustainable solutions? Health and well-being, again, should that be within lead on sustainable solutions? So we're all still still struggling with how do we how do we conceptualize these these issues? But this is um, a, a plan uh, for, for Brookfield to reimagine real estate and help us to build this this better world for people, business, community and the planet. So we're starting at fundamentals in all of our buildings, in all of our businesses. So the corporate reporting obligation. So we'll move on to some data shortly. Um, but the, the issue that we have as an organisation is that we are both financially and legally now responsible for providing good quality, accurate consumption data, which has now become essential for our corporate reporting, whether that be for Gresby, uh, Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, whether it's for our Net Zero Asset Management Managers Initiative. Each one of these organisations in some way and, and, and shape um, needs and requires data to be inputted into the various platforms so that we can be assessed. And it's the same, not just for Brookfield, it's the same for all property management companies, property developers who determine and decide to sign up to these, these types of disclosures and these types of platforms. Um, what we are seeing is that they are now becoming a value driven exercise for those organisations. Because we're now actually being assessed by banks and investment companies, clients and end users in terms of where they will be investing their, their funds to allow us to then go out and build more future future developments. And tenants are demanding more from their landlords now before they'll take space. They want to see what certification are we operating under? Is the building lead well DNGB um, in, in Germany? Do we have BRIAM um, in construction, BRIAM in refurbishment, BRIAM in use? Um, or are we are we uh, certified under neighbours? So there are a number of things now that are becoming um, really relevant in this ESG environment that are driving operational change and engineering change that I'll come on to shortly. <clears throat> one of the Im one of the impacts and one of the issues that we saw during the pandemic, um, which then prompted um, a review of how we were operating our buildings from a, an engineering perspective were the, the lack of occupants in the buildings, which was at the time um, you know, something new to everybody, buildings that were completely empty. So this graph here is a graph that I was created to, to try and demonstrate over the, 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 the two pandemic significant periods that we've had over the last few years, the level of occupants that we saw across our buildings. 
and you see from left to right, that's a sort of steady incremental increase in the people returning to buildings from the initial pandemic um, um, period. Um, but we're still seeing significant reduction in the amount of people occupying our properties and our buildings. And that's prompting a number of a number of things. Um, and I'll come on to how we how we um, discovered how the buildings were operated against our energy profiles. So the the line at the top of the graph indicates the the actual um, footfall, the actual occupants and attendees to the buildings pre COVID. Uh, and that was circa around 19,300 people we would see across our portfolio of buildings in London. And that that graph is just a straight line. It's indicative, um, but the graph below shows from left to right a 4% to 42% recovery period. So at the lowest, at the earliest time of the pandemic, and we only started taking these occupancy numbers as we were coming out of the, the first pandemic period. So we were somewhere seeing around 4% occupants in, in the building and currently we're up to somewhere between 42% fluctuating 42% to 48% currently in our building. So that's that's indicating there's potentially a work practice change that we're still not seeing people back into the office in sufficiently large numbers to what we were used to pre pre COVID. So that may suggest that our engineering designs and engineering approaches for the future may need to change. What I've also showed is the fact that there are now two um, occupation periods across the given week. We're seeing a Monday to Friday um, uh, trend and we're seeing a Tuesday to 30 trend, which indicates a plus or minus 4% difference. So we are potentially seeing a, a change in a very small but basic change in terms of the habits of the UK workforce in the commercial offices, certainly in, in London and the buildings that that we are currently uh, managing. So it was an interesting graph to, to develop because we can see that this is now a very gradual. If we continued this as a trend, we would probably be the back end of 2023-24 before we can potentially say we're back to normal pre-COVID levels. So it's an interesting graph to try and assimilate when we see future development decisions being being made. So demand and control. So these graphs here, I've lifted these graphs from our um, effectively our energy uh, management system uh, for the portfolio. So I've just selected four four buildings there. And these cover the same periods. They're actually uh, based in quarters um, because uh, I, I didn't have time to, to download all the data and put them into uh, comparative graphs. But what these graphs are primarily indicating is that Despite us having no people in the building, our buildings are still operating um, as though they were operating with people fully engaged in those occupations. So that became a, a very interesting um, assessment to be made in terms of how we were controlling um, our buildings and we were controlling them effectively against the guidance that was coming out from the various um, institutions, various industry bodies um, that we that we should maintain full fresh air uh, and maintain the buildings operational. Now, as we've just seen during the initial pandemic, 4% of people in the building is, is just a, such a small number, yet we were still running all of our HVAC, all of our chillers in the normal operational control description of operations, as we call it, as we as we design, install and hand over our buildings. So there's a, there's a, a distinct lessons learned here that we're looking at pandemics and we're looking at potentially other issues that could affect occupants and occupation of buildings that our control systems need to be able to recognize the fact that people are not in the building we don't need to run our plant um, as we were prior to the um, the incident or the input and therefore we need to get cleverer and more intelligent in terms of how we manage our our buildings so there's a clear disconnect with occupation and we were running our buildings to set point operations as we would day in day out so there was no intelligence no analytics in terms of um, being able to assess the performance of those buildings there was a distinct in inability to react to change we were focused on um, resolving the indoor air quality um, aspects rather than well, what else was happening in terms of the efficiency of those buildings our buildings are still designed to a level of basic building control and that that's 
that's a result of buildings being designed and built back in 20, 2011, uh, 12, 14 and 16, where thing designs were being uh, developed to allow today's buildings to be constructed as, as new as new buildings. So we, there is a bit of a lag around the um, the development of building controls. Uh, we did focus on indoor air quality against pan the pandemic. Lack of guidance and knowledge at the time, this was all new to everybody, to all the facilities managers. It was all new. We were all running around trying to find, well, what do we do? Where's the guidance? And it took quite a, quite a few months for that to come out. Um, we're still designing for occupancy. Um, we need to look at now designing for occupants. Um, we're still designing to standards that need to, to develop into um, the lessons learned from these periods and for the future ESG and net zero carbon um, challenge. And then we had tenant and landlord obligations. So our, our leases say we must provide X, Y and Z. And therefore that's what many, many people did, that they maintain those services uh, and maintain them so they couldn't be compromised on their lease agreements. And caretaker operations. Um, we didn't have a plan for caretaker operations. Nobody in the building, what do we do? Uh, and therefore the default position was to move to tenant landlord obligations, maintain services and do the best we can. So energy and emissions management must connect with the occupant in driving sustainable operations. That's the next challenge, sustainable operations. And we'll touch on that later. Systems need to have sufficient intelligence to react automatically and intuitively. The argument for further AI, and I think that that is becoming more and more important um, as we see modern buildings um, develop. So some real lessons learned for Brookfield, and I'm sure uh, through the discussions I've had, other people had similar experiences. So the net zero carbon pathway is yet another challenge for us. Um, I wanted to talk about this today because it's a real challenge for us um, and we're as Brookfield um, embarking on a science based targets initiative, um, which is basically setting targets for mid, so short, mid and long term attainment of net zero by 2050. That's our goal. Uh, others are taking a different view on that. Some are taking a goal to 2030, some 2040. Um, but we have taken a much more long term, uh, primarily given because of our size. Um, and this is a major challenge that people are still grappling with. Um, and our, our challenge is to, for our scope one and two, is to set plans for each asset, showing a timeline, and more importantly, the cost to achieve, the cost of ESG, the cost of net zero, is yet to be defined and understood. And our scope three emissions, embedded carbon materials, supply chain policies, tenant energy usage, as I spoke about earlier, and the evolution of the green lease agreement. We're now incorporating green leases into our into our leases so that we can encourage our tenants to to work with us to create smarter, intelligent, more efficient, efficient buildings. But on the journey, unexpected things may happen like a pandemic and therefore how do we react to them? So the net zero challenge is real. We're all trying to. To comply with this challenge, um, but there will be things on the way that may may have a different different impact and different direction. So this is just an overview of, of, of our approach working with science based targets. Um, we are looking at a more longer term, as I've alluded to. Um, but the, the key the key challenge here is the fact that we will still be looking to offset various um, um, emissions profiles at the end of, of, of the initial challenge because we're not going to be able to achieve in, in the reality of this world um, a complete net zero through deploying technology to deploying changes of practices. Uh, there will become a point where we will be unable to achieve that final golden net zero and there may have to be some net zero offsets procured so that we can assure that we've done everything we possibly can to support the UK approach uh, and indeed our, our, our own approach. So there are a number of um, issues to be resolved, particularly around um, selecting um, the trajectory of each individual business. And I'll show you what that actually means in terms of um, compliance. So the visibility of emissions, this is where we start to see the reality of what scope one and scope two, scope three emissions are. And then we'll come on to how perhaps we can solve some of these. Um, what we didn't 
appreciate at the time was that scope three emissions are by far the largest challenge that we have, as I mentioned earlier. And you can see the proportion there in terms of what that actually looks like. Um, the complexity of scope three is 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 enormous, but it, a lot of that falls into operational requirements and operational relationships with the supply chain that support the buildings. Um, and, and also you can you can see some of the numbers that we've initially calculated in terms of purchase goods and services are by far the largest contributory factor to scope three. And therefore, how do we make those savings? Uh, there is elements of energy within scope three, um, which are part of those procured services. So the whole complex of emissions and visibility emissions is now becoming virtually an art form and a, and a science literally on its own. And 77% of Brookfield's properties uh, emissions sit within scope three. So our challenge is not with scope one and two, although probably there is a challenge, it's about scope three. So here we see what that actually transfers to. So Brookfield, the entities within Brookfield properties um, should set a scope for one and two targeted line to 1.5 degrees or higher. There are two figures in this, in this, in this graph. Um, the required ambition is to make reductions to achieve a 1.5 degree rate of change, so not to exceed 1.5 degrees. And then there is another adjusted ambition, which is effectively set at 70% reductions. Now you can see the challenges here just for scope one and two. Year on year, we're looking at a 4.2% saving. And by 2025, that equates to 25.2%. And by 2030, that's a 48% saving that we need to make against just on our scope one and two emissions. And as I've been su suggesting to my internal um, executive board, that the challenge here is to save almost 50% of energy use, both in existing building stock and new building stock is a significant challenge of investment and what that investment looks like. So there are some significant challenges that intelligent buildings now need to rise to to support reductions in energy consumption and emissions. The investments balanced need to be balanced through value. So any investments we do make need to have not a return on investment, um, although that is an element. It's more about the value that can be contributed to that property, that building or that actual asset. So whatever investment we, we make needs to have an investment value in terms of emissions reduction and value to the property. An end to end engagement with the block for, excuse me, with the value chain is essential. And that value chain is from tenant, landlord, tenant and all the services and stakeholders involved in that property. And a change of emphasis is needed. Uh, work and, and its workplaces perhaps need to adapt and change to a different way of design, a different way of op operation, but also a different way of utilisation. This is just developing a plan for success. So this is how we're approaching it at the moment. We hope by the end of the year to have our um, science based targets fully defined and accepted. I'm very doubtful of that. I think by the time that we've looked at what the investment strategy is, whether we even sign up to a science based targets or if we do, it'll be somewhere along the, the journey in 2023. There are some significant decisions to be made and we're working with um, a, a consultant at the moment to determine what that actually looks like uh, in terms of our investment strategy before we commit to signing the science based targets initiative documentation. But there are a number of people who have already already done that. People like our, our peers, uh, Landset, British Land, these are all effectively lifted from um, web based um, ESG reports. So you can see um, our peers in the UK are all signing up to net zero by 2030. 2030, the British Land Landsec. Um, others take a slightly different different view and have taken a different um, direction in terms of 70% reduction by 2030. So we know the industry is moving this way. The challenge is there. Technology needs to rise rise to it. And the, but more importantly, the way we think about how we design and manage our buildings has now become subtly important. Just want to give you a slight case study here. This is 30 Fenchurch Street. Um, it's a new building that is going live for Brookfield um, effectively um, in the next few days. Um, and we're immediately going into a refurbishment um, project. It's a building that was designed in 2004. If anybody knows it, it was called Plantation House previously. 
Um, but we recognise the value of that building um, in terms of our net zero pathway. Um, and we will be installing um, air source heat pumps um, to the point where we will be looking to introduce hydrogen ready boilers uh, in a modular fa fashion, simply as the reserve. Um, there's a lot of talk at the moment about all electric buildings and all electric buildings are great. But as we found with 30 Fenchurch Street already, the infrastructure from UKPN, the energy company, is not sufficient. And therefore, we're in urgent discussions with them to see if we can increase our available supply capacity to buildings. So these are some of the realities of trying to achieve some of this um, commitment. Um, so we'll be looking to you know, install the latest energy efficient chillers, new PV systems, a new B BMS system using the Honeywell Forge building analytics. This has now become a fundamental platform for Brookfield in the UK, where we're now engaged fully with building analytics uh, via the Honeywell Forge uh, platform. And we're introducing phase change material technology to our water heaters, on-floor water heaters. Um, this is a, a new technology that's come to, come to the market. Um, but these are the things that we're having to engage with to try and make this compliance. And you can see the level of investment now that's that's needed. We currently have a e building that's EPC derated, um, and our aspirations is to get that to a B by 2025. But the only way we can do that is to um, increase the investment in technology, new equipment, and more energy efficient equipment. And again, we're also looking at um, adding value to the asset by undertaking all this work. Um, and some of that is now being been in, in, in the way that we're actually considering the original base build design documentation. Uh, and we're looking to review that in line with the new BCO guidance, which is um, currently under review to see how we can change the way that our tenants are looking at their buildings and, and design them much more efficiently than previously we, we've, we've ever had, including trying to solve the energy performance gap. Very, very quickly, net zero in construction. Uh, this is another one of our buildings recently completed. It's the it's now called the Gilbert. It's the old um, 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 headquarters for Bloomberg in Finsbury Square. Um, and we've achieved um, some significant um, reductions in um, the, the use of building fabric, building materials uh, to achieve net zero in construction as part of the refurbishment. So we've taken a very old building, improved it significantly, and improved it through modeling and through delivery of um, good engineering practice working with our architects and our and our consultants so we've achieved all the targets that were set um, my only concern here is the the operational energy um, the modeling that we currently have isn't sufficiently in my opinion robust enough to justify what realistically happens when a tenant occupies a building so there is some caution around um, in my mind um, the fact that the industry is quoting figures that are yet to be proven. So, but it, it is what we have at the moment. We have models that we have to utilize, um, but I think that needs to be continued into the building building in use. Intelligent operational engineering. So, as I mentioned earlier, Honeywell has now become a strategic business partner across our portfolio, providing remote engineering analytics. We see this is the only way to deliver good quality um, support to our properties with expert resource sitting somewhere outside of our environment working for us 24 7 365 days a year. We're also now developing a, an internal engineering company an Engco in preparation for our net zero carbon pathway. Current structures in the industry do not align with delivering net zero carbon buildings and we need to find a different model and a different method methodology of supporting and maintaining our buildings. Services procurement, uh, we're embedding ESG principles in all of our scope three service contracts. Um, that's one of the key ways we can we can drive the, the scope reduction um, in such a significantly large number. Apprenticeship scheme, partnering with Honeywell, preparing our young intelligent building professionals. There's a major, major gap in terms of skills, knowledge and understanding of how our new buildings need to operate and particularly on the basis of using building analytics platforms uh, and intelligent and uh, artificial artificial intelligence. So we need to create our own engineers of the future because there are none at the moment, I can assure you. And initiatives aligned to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and improving EPC ratings and property value. It's fundamental. It's one of the government's challenges to us now to 
increase the EPUC ratings of all commercial buildings by 2025. So we're on that journey. Um, we're looking to be compliant as quickly as we possibly can. So the all electric concept is in deployment. Air source heat pumps seems to be the selected technology at this stage and heat recovery from cooling and heating ventilation and air conditioning plant is now becoming even more important. Demand reduction and management capacity equals demand plus 10 percent modular. We've seen so many times where the capacity of a building is so in excess of the actual demand that we are in increasing the embedded carbon that that we've that we don't actually need in the buildings but also the losses that occur through the the additional capacity that doesn't need to be there is now needing to be recognized a blend of new net zero construction and refurbishment investment opportunities is is our direction that we see there's a blend there we will always need to create new intelligent buildings of the future to maintain that future requirement but a lot of our buildings will still be around by 2050s and therefore we need to make sure that our refurbishment strategy is, is aligned to the current requirements. Hydrogen ready heating, we're working with the market at the moment to try and bring forward the commercial um, uh, deployment of hydrogen ready boilers um, in, in the real sense and, and 30 Fenture Street is, is hopefully our, our first attempt at that. Operational in-use assessments, grasping the challenge. Um, there's a real temptation for the operational phase not to put itself out there in terms of operation and use for, for many, many reasons. Um, however, I think that's our next fundamental step in terms of managing our buildings to a net zero carbon trajectory and pathway. Unless we are monitoring and having certification in use, then it's un unlikely we will ever achieve these, um, these um, aspirations in terms of net zero pathway. And the latest system and asset selection to achieve best in class operational efficiencies. We now need to to look at that investment strategy and, and select equipment and systems that are actually going to drive long term savings, um, which regrettably hasn't been the way in the past. It's always been lowest cost. Whenever we're tendering uh, projects, it now needs to fundamentally shift to creating value rather than lowest cost and lowest capex cost day one. And training and development the next generation of technicians is is vital and, and a necessity now. We we are, we are far behind the curve, uh, and we we won't move forward until that particular issue has been solved. And that is my presentation. I think I'm just about on time, Yang. So hopefully, hopefully yep, that's yep. that's okay. Thank you. Thank Spot you. on Spot time. time. So, so everyone, everyone, thank you, thank you for your, your patience. And uh, I have, I, I can see there are two uh, comments or questions probably you can address uh, Gary or other uh, attendees. Please feel free to tap in uh, your questions uh, or comments in the chat area. The first comment is made by uh, Shonghan Doran said temperature need to be reduced when there's no one in the building. I think that is when you presented pandemic impact. Do you, how, do you like to comment on that? Whether you can reduce temperature when the building is unoccupied? Yeah, and, and it's, a, it's a good a good point to make. And, and it, it was one of the issues that we that we found is that, as I, as I mentioned, that we were um, focused on maintaining set point design. Um, so despite there being maybe 4%, which probably in some buildings referred to something like 11 people, um, a ridiculously low number, we were still trying to maintain set point of 21 degrees. Um, and therefore, that is not efficient for a, for a completely empty building virtually for us to, to make any sense of, of, of making those types of decisions. So yes, temperature, volumetric airflow, um, to a certain extent, humidity, but that's a different different subject. Um, needs needs to be needs to be considered, and and connecting occupants to the building, so we know exactly where they are in the building, so we can manage our our, our temperatures and our systems to specific focused areas of the building, would be a, a major step forward. But our buildings aren't designed to that level of granular control. Um, they are in certain respects. But when we're talking about large buildings, um, it is difficult at times to get energy efficiency efficiencies when we're talking about large uh, handling units and large chillers. Um, we just lose that efficiency argument straight away. So that is a problem and it does need to be addressed in the future. Yeah, 
thank you. That that's that's very good com uh, kind of response. This whole uh, industry solutions. The second uh, question from Mike is about keeping boilers may harm the EPC rating when you electrical houses, but in, they might install boilers straight away. So that is really certification for EPC whether they will change straight away even just after this constructed. It's a behavioral kind of complex. Do you like to comment on that regarding EPCs? So I guess they started to focus it. Yes, and it and it, um, it, it it is an issue, and we've looked at what that means in terms of the the tabular EPC rating and the number of number of options. Um, and what we find, because you have the EPC rating and it, it has a, a range of numbers, so you can hit EPC D C B A over various um, parameters um, or or um, so we could have an EPC of, 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 of 26 and an EPC of, of 20. Um, so depending on, on what other mitigating factors have been introduced to that building, gas boilers may have a significant issue and, and, and drop you into the, to the lower EPC rating. But we're, we're trying to, to put as much into our buildings as possible. Um, but I, it is a valid point that it needs to be adjusted. So if you retain gas boilers, you may need to offset by investing in other areas. Um, and we're seeing the, the hydrogen ready aspect as being something that needs to be considered by EPC. Uh, and therefore, uh, the whole package needs to be assessed, not, not just having the boilers, but there is an impact by, just, by retaining the boilers, both at certification uh, and then subsequently into, um, into use. OK. Thank you. The next question is by uh, Tondi Alori. Uh, it's question is about how to deal with the solar PPA on landlord area when tenants using the energy. Yeah, that's um, that's a good question. It's a very very good question, and it's back to um, how we how we monitor and measure all of the energies that are coming into the building, and then how we apportion them as as landlords and, and tenants. Um, the, the one key thing is that we need to to measure all of the energy that's being generated in the building and all the energy that's being consumed to allow us then to apportion that um, that energy. Um, it's difficult to apportion something like a solar thermal system into the energy mix per tenant because some of the systems are so small um, by default because roof space in London is very small. Um, it becomes a number that doesn't even move the dial. Um, but as long as we're measuring it and detailing it uh, and presenting it, then at least we can then look to apportion it um, in, in slightly different other ways so that we'll offset elements of the um, boiler capacity and LTHW generated um, before we apply that to the uh, tenants uh, and, and, and apportion it across those tenants or by the consumption that is measured on, on each individual each individual floor. So from our perspective, we're looking at allocating that to a landlord central plant, um, which then offsets the amount of energy that the, the tenant is actually consuming by default. But they're only charged for the energy that they use. The key here is to deploy a metering strategy that is sufficiently granular to allow us to measure tenant consumption. Mm. And then we can offset against that energy consumption in other ways in terms of investment of technology, yes, whether that be solar or PV. Yeah, I totally agree. If you cannot measure, you cannot manage. That is true. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, there, there are two very interesting questions uh, from our Derek. Uh, two separate questions, I think. The first one is uh, you mentioned reducing embodied carbons by 50%. Can you see more how did you achieve it? Uh, and the second question is about variable technologies are you going to use that in your uh, kind of intelligent building operations okay so the the reduction in, in embedded carbon um, we achieve that by effectively um, reusing the majority of the building fabric uh, we change very little in the in the building fabric it's itself uh, including um, uh, ceilings and uh, we didn't install any ceilings for instance it's all slab to slab um, it's a very old fashioned design. It, it would be great for an architectural practice to move in there. It's a fantastic um, 
um, design for um, for um, steel columns and um, 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 high soffit ceilings. And we reused everything effectively. The the only things that were um, um, that were installed were a new core uh, to increase the lift capacity. Um, and we re literally reused all of the windows uh, to a certain extent, some of the flooring um, riser position. So there was minimal um, minimal interruption to the to the building fabric. Um, and if you walk around the building, you'll you'll probably you'll be able to see that in terms of um, the lack of um, um, the lack of inclusion of modern building techniques, it virtually looks exactly as it did when we bought the building um, four or five years ago. Second one was wearable, wearable technology. Um, this is something that, yeah, I think the industry, we're talking to Honeywell um, about what their strategy is in terms of connecting occupants to the building. Um, and as of yet, we haven't found any building management system house or system OEM or system developer that from a building scale is able to connect the the occupant to the building. We can do it as as a small, um, let's say scientific research um, approaches, but to do that holistically when we're talking about our buildings, which are in certain respects, 8,000, 12,000 people is is a challenge yet to be thought through in my in my opinion. The technology is is available, but there isn't a product yet that we've actually seen that we could actually procure at that sort of scale. We're currently deploying um, a building asset app um, for our um, occupants, but that's more akin to the social side of um, the building, connecting people to artwork, connecting them to um, um, social events and, and things like that. So that is our, our first step. But the uptake of that is, is very small, but, but I see the uptake of connecting people to the building uh, through technology, through wearables, through their phones um, as a next step somewhere. It may not be the next step, but it may be four, three or four down the road for a building of, of our sort of scale, whereby we can then pass information in two directions in terms of the performance of the building, uh, the needs of the individual before they arrive at the building, what space do they actually prefer what lighting levels, what air quality is, is in specific zones. And we are working with Honeywell on a new indoor air quality sensor at the moment. We've signed an NDA with Honeywell and we're developing with them um, an indoor air quality sensor that can actually then connect the environment, that part of the environment to to the um, to the occupant through their phone. So there's there's a lot going on in the space, but nothing we can actually buy at the moment. Mm. That, yeah, that that's very interesting. Thank you, uh, Gary. So that my question. Uh, please feel free to uh, uh, type in your questions here. Uh, just while uh, I'm, we're waiting for your questions, can I ask a question related to the variable sensor and connecting people with the buildings? Uh, there are a number of dashboard kind of facilities uh, developing to help uh, occupants to access to understand. Uh, a huge amount of operational energy uh, developed. I'm working in the university, we found it, it is difficult for us to access the energy data as we wanted. So the question is who owns the data, how to make the data available, and then we have better systems now The people using business B, PI, uh, BI to see the energy data, the occupancy data. So do you have any, uh, can you tell a bit more about your dashboard? Do you offering web uh, portals to allow the tenants or to see the energy operation or water consumption data uh, better to engage? Yes, yes we do. And um, we are making significant improvements to enhance what we currently provide. and. What we're actually doing at the moment is we're actually automating our um, um, uh, tenant um, billing packages and our tenant um, metering systems. So when when their consumption comes back to us, it's immediately and will be immediately relayed back to back to themselves. At the moment, we're it's a little bit more uh, manual, um, sadly, but we're currently working with Snyder to automate um, each one of our buildings so that it the data moves to the cloud and then 
tenants have access to the cloud um, to to then download their uh, their data if they're not already managing it through their own installed metering systems. But we're, we're offering we are offering um, a metering system that gives them total access to all of their data. Um, it is their data in terms of consumption, and there are some you know, some some data. Um, privacy um, policies that we need to be mindful of. But at the end of the day, we make that data as discreet as possible, but then as secure as possible to, for that particular tenant. So yes, the, 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 we are actually doing that, um, but we are making some significant improvements under the new buildings and the existing buildings that we have. That's one of our key investment strategies, which is now because of net zero carbon pathway that we are uh, endeavouring to, to, uh, to move along and our EPC requirements um, and our ESG requirements, that data now is fundamental and it has to be engaged directly with the tenant and the landlord, otherwise it's not going to work and we're not going to see these significant savings we need to make. Okay, excellent. Thank you, that's really very useful for me. And then uh, you mentioned about data, it seems there might be a large amount of data as you'll be kind of collecting. Uh, so how do you deal with those data? Are you, uh, you mentioned about your collaboration with Honeywell and Snyder. Do you work on kind of machine learning or artificial intelligence uh, in terms of software development? Uh, kind of try to make the science of data or automated warning or analytics, for example? Yeah, the, the, the Honeywell Forge platform um, is probably one of the, the best ones that I've seen thus far. Um, Snyder, Siemens and ABB have uh, similar types of projects, but Honeywell seem to have, have taken it to a, a different level in terms of the artificial intelligence and the machine learning that they uh, that they deploy. So Forge for us is, is, is for two things. One is to look at how our buildings are are performing in, in, in use, but it, it's also there to allow us to look at how do we improve our efficiencies and value um, by extending the asset's life by understanding its performance in use. So it's it's many different facets facets are coming to, to the fore with Forge that allowing us to change our operational approach. So that data is 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 fundamental and each time and each day the the, the platform is learning. Um, how that system is performing uh, and within the rules structure that uh, Honeywell have created, the basic set of AI rules, um, they will then give us that information in terms of a triage um, of where we should be targeting our resources to, to make our buildings more operate more efficient. So Honeywell, Honeywell provides that technology, they provide us the, the uh, artificial intelligence um, within their software to then give us the information, but it's continuously machine learning um, about the performance of the of the property, and each one of our properties is completely different. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Are there any other questions from the attendees? No. There's so many uh, interesting topics you, you mentioned about this. Uh, corporate rating applications like uh, Briam or Well or Lead or Briam in use. Um, do you mind to tell us more which one is more kind of compulsory or which one is more on volunteering basis? So uh, is it like uh, Briam I, as I understood is volunteering in uh, systems, isn't it? So it is something you have to uh, provide for 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 the purposes of regulation, for example. Yeah, in, in terms of um, building in use, um, we haven't yet been been forced to adopt any operational standards um, for in use. They're, they're, they're somewhat more voluntary, mm. um, which is for me one of the more frustrating things but in terms of Briam in construction um, that's effectively part of the planning requirements um, mm. 
in, in, in the, the majority of cases that we, we need to comply with. We need to show a level of energy efficiency yeah. um, and whether that's with BRIAM neighbours or one of the other certifications um, will be depending on the, the the planning requirements at the time and in the region and the location. So they differ significantly from region to region for Brookfield because we're a global global player. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, we, we tend in the UK to follow BRIAM. Mm, yeah. Neighbours in use now because it's through BRE is becoming yeah. more of a focal, yeah. focal adopted in use uh, yeah. platform. Uh, and, and, and that's where we're moving to now. We've, we've not resisted, I think the industry has resisted operational use for, for far too long and we need to start that that mm -hmm. journey now. So it does become more of a um, a requirement for compliance rather than it just being a voluntary uh, in use. And, and our tenants are, are looking for, for those sorts of things now, but albeit they may be looking for them, um, it's still a voluntary um, determination for a landlord to, to comply. But if he doesn't, then he'll miss out with a deal. So it's important that we we do start to recognise that performance and use is now critical. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just yeah. Sort of yeah. 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 Okay, I th I can see quite a few uh, people have to go uh, due to other uh, engagement. Yes. I think we're nearly about an hour. <laughs> yeah, 52 minutes is good. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of stuff. I, I, I made a few notes. I might get back to you and discuss more. It's a fascinating talk. No problem. Yeah. No problem at all. Uh, really lucky to have your slides. I think many, many our members will be benefited from this area. Uh, it's covered quite a wide range of topics and knowledge and insight. We didn't know, for example, the scope three, the breakdown, of that uh, carbon emission is really kind of cutting edge information we can get. That I'm very grateful for for those information. Um, no problem. Any other questions, guys? Okay. Again, uh, many many thanks, and uh, I'll look forward to see you again, uh, Gary. No problem. Look forward to it. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.